παιδιά. Θα πω πάρα πάρα πολύ λίγα γιατί δεν θέλω να κόψω αυτό τον ρυθμό. Λοιπόν, ο Μάρκ όπως είδατε παρουσιάζει με ένα πολύ ξεχωριστό τρόπο ένα φυσικό φαινόμενο και γενικά θέματα για τη φυσική. Όλο αυτό το show του το ονομάζει η φυσική είναι ροκ. Μέσα από αυτή την παράσταση την οποία ονομάζει η θεωρία της κιθάρας ε, δείχνει την επιστήμη η οποία κρύβεται πίσω από τους παλμούς από τις χορδές της κιθάρας του μέσα από την παράστασή του θα μας δείξει τους τρόπους με, το, με τους οποίους οι δονήσεις των χορδών μιας κιθάρας θα μπορούσαν με συγχωρείτε ένα λεπτό θα μπορούσαν να εφαρμοστούν στα μόρια από τα οποία αποτελούμαστε με μία όμως διαφοροποίηση. Οι χορδές δονούνται σε επιπλέον διαστάσεις. Έτσι η παράσταση αυτή δείχνει το θαυμαστό και τον θαυμασμό και τον ενθουσιασμό που μπορεί να παρουσιαστεί ένα θέμα μέσα από τις αιτικές επιστήμες, μέσα από τη φυσική και τα μαθηματικά. Ε, θέλω να σας καλωσορίσω σε αυτό το Φεστιβάλ Επιστήμης και Τεχνολογίας. Κάναμε κάθε προσπάθεια για να σας παρουσιάσουμε καινοτόμες πραγματικά ε, παρουσιάσεις επιστημονικών θεμάτων. Πιστεύω ότι το καταφέραμε. Ε, να καλωσορίσουμε τα παιδιά από την Ιόνιο. Πού είναι τα παιδιά από την Ιόνιο? <Ρι> από τον Κωστέα Γείτονα? <Ρι> Κανένα. <Ρι> από τον Κωστέα Γείτονα? <Ρι> Δεν ήρθανε. Από το από τη Γενάδιο <Ρι> Από του Παπάγου <Ρι> Από του Παπάγου <Ρι> Και ποια άλλα παιδιά έχουν μείνει που δεν είπαμε Ποια άλλα παιδιά <Ρι> Λοιπόν να ευχαριστήσουμε βέβαια και το Βρετανικό Συμβούλιο γιατί χωρίς τη δική του συμπαράσταση δεν θα ήταν ο Μάρκ εδώ σήμερα μαζί μας. Λοιπόν, καλή διασκέδαση.
my real name. Uh, yes, I have been told I should go into psychiatry. Are you mentally ill? Go and see Dr. Looney. Uh, and yes, I've also been told I look like a weird cross between Ant and Death on British television. But that's, uh, no. uh, I'm going to talk about sound. Guys, listen, listen, I'm anxious a minute. If you talk, the person next to you can't hear me, alright? So I'm just going to have to stop you talking for a minute. <laughs> okay, so I'm going, to talk, I'm going to talk about sound and vibration for a bit. Uh, how come when I hear a. I just can't get no. If I have to spend every second going. Oh. Guys, guys, stop talking, will ya? <laughs> guys, you can't do this when you're talking, alright? <laughs> right, okay, that, that level is okay. Um, I just can't get no. What is it about this stuff, this equipment, that causes that revolutionary, history changing sound? Uh, I'm going to talk about sound and vibration, uh, and then later on it's going to get a bit weird, okay? A bit kind of. Uh, going to try and melt your brain. So, first of all, vibration. Vibrations are all around us. What I'm doing with this air bazooka is sending a pulse which travels through the medium until it hits something. I kind of need someone with long, flowy, uh, floppy hair. Uh, this we made it here. Would you like to stand up for a moment? Just stand up for a minute. Just stand up for a moment. That's great. Uh, all right, got doors. See if we can get a double. So sit. See how far away I can. Uh, Oh, sat down again. Round of applause for our volunteer. Anyway. Um, so that's kind of like a sound, but with two big differences. That's hard and powerful to be a sound. We don't detect sounds with our hairstyles, we just detect sounds with tiny little bones and hairs in our ears. Secondly, that was just a single vibration which stopped it. Sound is usually a continuous vibration. The number of vibrations in a second is called the frequency. In fact, all I'm doing right now is I'm shaking the air around at different rates, different frequencies, in order to talk. Here at the bottom of my neck, there's a little fleshy flap. When you blow air over that, it makes a sound, the frequency of which depends on the size of the flap. So a tiny little plastic one like this, you blow air over the top of it, and you get a really high frequency kind of monkey noise. That's why babies have got such a cute little high voice, because the flap is very small. And then as you get older, the flap gets bigger and your voice gets deeper. That's why teenage boys sound a bit weird. I don't have a Because it's because the flap is growing faster than they can learn how to control. Um, that's also why they're a bit clumsy as well. Their limbs are growing faster than they can learn how to control. Uh, and that also applies to other parts of the body as well. Uh, above a little flap, I've got a tube. A tube of air in my neck. Obviously the tube's not that long. Okay, if it was that long, I'd be talking crap. Uh, but a tube has its own uh, resonances. And they're the frequencies from the little flap that get kind of emphasized or accentuated. And you can actually change those frequencies. You can actually change those frequencies of the tube in your neck. Guys, can you stop talking? No. <laughs> uh, guys, it's, uh, you're being a bit rude, okay? Just shush. You're being a bit rude. Shh. 
Um, so you can actually change those frequencies in your neck by filling the tube with a gas other than air. Hey, that's what I'm And our sound, like the pitch in my voice, has been raised. It has to touch the other. Sing along with that. Oh, just a minute. See, the trouble with helium is it's not oxygen. So I filled the tube in my neck with a gas other than air. That's changed the resonances of the tube and made my voice sound different. And then finally, from the top of the tube, uh, this equipment here, my teeth and tongue and lips, that kind of shapes or filters the sound from the tube, a bit like a wah wah pedal. Uh, Yeah, okay, so um, my teeth and tongue and lips that kind of shapes or filters the sound from the tube, uh, a bit like a wah wah pedal, in order to talk. And maybe it's because we humans got such incredibly good control over this stuff that we could create the entire range of sounds and therefore language and therefore civilization. Whereas chimps, and maybe even Neanderthal man, uh, all they could manage was the odd uh, 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 Oasis song. So um, I'm shaking the air around at different rates. If you try and shake the air around too fast, guys, you're being very rude. Will you stop talking, all right? And over here as well, just stop talking, okay? Is that all right? We all agreed? If you try and shake the air around too fast, what happens is the air kind of can't get out the wave itself in time, and you get a shock wave or sonic boom. I'm going to try and uh, create a shock wave here. Oh, we like that, do we? <laughs> okay, let's uh, start. It. Want it again? Oh, prepare me. Right. Oh, hurt me. Um, one, more, one more time. Right, everyone, right, everyone, listen. If you're really silent, if you're absolutely silent, you might be able to hear a as it bounces between the walls. But you have to be utterly silent. You cannot use your voice at all. All right, we all agreed on that? Yeah, right, silence now. Maybe later. Uh, silence. Okay. Did you hear a, t -t 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 a little little echo? Let's try, try it again. Silence again. Silence. Silence. Silence now. Shh. Shut up. Right. Everyone, stop talking now. Right. Shh. Silence. Stop talking. If you're talking, stop. No, we need silence. We need actual silence, okay? So if you're talking, stop talking, right? Huh? Uh, so what's happening there, I'm sending a kink along the whip, okay? Yes, a kink. Um, actually, bought that in a really dodgy shop in Wales, right? Yeah. <laughs> Guys, right, so what you want that for a physics show? What kind of pervert are you? Um, but I send a kink along the whip, and because it's thinner, it tapers along its length. That means the kink travels faster and faster until at that tiny little stringy bit at the end, it's going 700 miles an hour, the speed of sound. The air can't move that fast, so you get a shock wave or sonic boom. Guys, can you just stop talking? Is that right? <laughs> So, that's usually what sound is about, moving the air around. But it's not just air that can vibrate. Water can vibrate as well. The mate 
mating song of the blue whale. It can travel hundreds of miles underwater. In fact, before ship engines came along, two whales might have been able to hear each other almost anywhere in the world. It's so much louder than a jet engine, but it's like comparing a jet engine to someone shouting. God, you imagine living next to one. Hello, ladies! Who wants a piece of me? Well, the Japanese, if you're not careful. Um, so air can vibrate, water can vibrate, solids can vibrate as well, and earthquake could be said to be the sound of heavy rock. The vibrations of a bridge or a building could be said to be the sound of heavy metal. And I'm going to show you how all these different vibrations follow the same... Guys, stop talking, will you? I'm going to show you how all these vibrations follow the same simple maths, simple maths of sine waves. And if you understand that, you can understand almost anything, possibly everything. Let's try that again. Possibly everything. Uh, one more time. Possibly everything. That's better. In order to understand rock guitar, first you've got to look at the string. I'd like you to think of a string as kind of like a stretched out spring. Now the frequency of the simple side to side vibrations of a string or a stretched spring, what's called the fundamental frequency, depends on three things. Firstly the length. The shorter, the higher. When I put my finger on a fret, I shorten the length of the string so the frequency rises. <coughs> Secondly, tension. The looser, the lower. When I press down my whammy bar, I decrease the tension in the string so the frequency drops. <coughs> Finally, thickness. All of these strings are the same length and the same tension. It's just the lower pitched ones are thicker. And to get really low notes, they've got to be really thick. Which curiously also applies to basses. Sorry, British joke, doesn't travel well. Um, so here we've got a string in its fundamental pattern of vibration. <laughs> we call it its fundamental mode. That's going about once a second or one hertz. Uh, a guitar string might be going a hundred times a second, a hundred hertz, but still with that same pattern, just faster. But there can't be just a hundred hertz coming off this string. You see, if there were, then when I play with my wah-wah pedal that cuts out higher frequencies, it would have no effect. But you can hear that... Higher frequencies are being cut out, aren't they? You can all hear that? Yeah. So where do these higher frequencies come from? They come from the harmonics of the string. Now, 3,000 years ago, Pythagoras supposedly discovered the harmonics of the string, as well as that triangle theorem. You all done that yet in maths? The uh, Pythagoras right-angled triangle? Yeah. Um, he actually discovered neither of these things. He was just this legendary figure with a golden thigh who told people not to eat beans. And the only reason the triangle theorem was named after him was because he killed a cow when he heard about it off someone else. Wish it was that easy to get your name in history. E equals MC squared. Oh really? That's my theorem now. Thank you. Um, but let's pretend he discovered these, the harmonics. 
Over on the left, over on the left is the fundamental. I've slowed it down even further. But at the same time, a string vibrates in another pattern, having two regions of vibration twice as fast as the fundamental, at twice the fundamental frequency. That's called the first harmonic. And at the same time as well, it vibrates in another pattern at three times the fundamental frequency. And four times, and five times, six times, seven times, if we were to carry on with this animation. So if this fundamental is at 100 hertz, I know it's not there, just pretend it was a lot faster, then it's these harmonics of 200 hertz, 300 hertz, 400 hertz, 500, 600, 700 hertz, all the way up to human hearing range at 20,000 hertz that gives the string its higher frequencies. And when I play with my wah-wah pedal, all I'm doing is I'm letting these frequencies through or I'm filtering them out. So if I, if I rest my finger halfway along the string, so it vibrates either side of my finger at twice the fundamental frequency, I hear the first harmonic. Fundamental, first harmonic. You all hear the difference there, yeah? If I rest my finger a third of the way along the string, I hear the harmonic of the second kind. Closer again, I encounter the third kind. mathematical relationship between those frequencies, 100, 200, 300, 400, and so on. That's why strings sound nice. The trouble with strings is they're very quiet on their own. If I turn the volume down, mate, stop punching it. Oi, at the back, stop it. If I turn the volume down, you can hardly hear anything. That's because sound is about moving the air around and a thin little wire doesn't do that very well at all. Uh, now in a classical guitar or an acoustic guitar the string vibrates a thin wooden plate that can move more air around and makes the string louder. And we can actually see the vibrations of a classical guitar if we take a hologram of it. Uh, can you tell me what a hologram is? What's a hologram? Sorry? I need an answer. What, what's a hologram? I don't know. That's helpful. Uh, if you do know, say something. Okay, what's the first word that pops into your head? First English word that pops into your head when I say hologram? Star Wars. Star Wars. Okay, let's go with that. Shh, 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 shh. Guys! Shh. Shush. Right, let's go with Star Wars. What's the difference between the communications in Star Wars and us, like Skyping someone or something like that? What's the difference? They are different. There is a difference, isn't there? There's a difference between the communications in Star Wars and us doing a video conference. What's the difference? 3D. It's three-dimensional. Well done. Yeah. Okay, so a screen... A screen is just flat. 
It's two-dimensional. A hologram's got depth as well. It's 3D. So something to remember for later, okay? A hologram takes three dimensions worth of information and stores it on a two-dimensional surface. Just remember that for later. Guys, can you stop talking? If we take a hologram of a guitar, we can actually see the different patterns of vibration of the guitar at different frequencies. This was my PhD research at uh, Cardiff University, which I won't bore you with because uh, scientists talking about their own research tend to disappear up themselves like a Klein model. But if we understood how all of these different vibrations fitted together, in physics we say how they're coupled, we could build better guitars. So that's a classical guitar. Let's get back to rock guitar. In an electric guitar, we don't want the string to vibrate a thin wooden plate. This is a solid block of wood. We don't want it to vibrate it at all. Instead, what happens is that each of those harmonics, those patterns of vibration, Miss, Miss, just stop talking, all right? Yeah. You, 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 you're not looking at me yet. You're not looking at me yet. You're not looking at me yet. You're looking at me now. Stop talking. What happens in an electric guitar is that each of those patterns of vibration, those different harmonics, each of those induces a sine wavy electrical signal in the wires wrapped around these magnets. They're called pickups. They pick up the string's vibration via Faraday's laws of induction. So for each harmonic, there's a sine wavy electrical signal of a certain frequency coming out the lead of the guitar. Okay? Trouble with those signals is that they're very weak. What has to happen is that they're sent to an amplifier the amplifier takes alternating current from the mains, turns it into direct current, AC-DC, and uses that current to boost these incredibly weak signals. And the trouble with that is that they're very fragile. It's very difficult to keep that nice sine wavy shape as we boost the depth, the volume of the signal. Uh, where's everyone going? It's, oh, all right. Uh, does anyone else have to move or leave in the next half hour? No. No? You're all sorted? Okay. Okay, so what happens is each of those harmonics, it's very difficult to boost their amplitude in the circuitry of the amp. It's very difficult to make them bigger and still keep that nice sine wavy shape. In the 1960s, guitarists started turning the volume up past the limits of the amplifier. And that started to squash the top of the sine waves, made them more like square waves. And you know what? The squashed waves sounded cool. That squashed top gave each harmonic Harmonics of its own. The false electronic harmonics. Plugging the string caused a huge, rich cascade of new frequencies. That cascade of harmonics turned the simplest riff into something powerful. You could get great results without requiring great expertise. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, add to that the fact that it's so economically cheap just to put wood and magnets together so anyone can afford it, and bullseye. You've got the sound of a revolution. So we've seen now just understanding some simple maths, adding sine waves together. You can get a very deep understanding of something you might have thought was so complex and complicated 
that it's almost magical, like the vibrations of a musical instrument. That's what physics is about, really. We start off simple, and we build those simple systems into more interesting, real systems. Mate, mate, you're not looking at me yet. You're not looking at me yet. You're, not, you're looking at me now. Put your phone away, please. That's what physics is about. We start off simple, and we put those simple systems together into more interesting, real systems. Yes, the simple systems we do at school can be a bit dull. You know, mass on a spring. Woo, that's exciting. Biology, you get to cut stuff up. Wow! Chemistry, you get to blow stuff up. Wow! Physics, mass on a spring. <laughs> We've got to walk before we can run. But if you think of each of the atoms in our bodies as like a little mass, and the forces between the atoms as like little springs, then you say, ah, that's better. I'm getting the bigger idea here. I'm seeing how things fit together. Physics is difficult. It's lots of details. But you can bring it all together. With physics, it's easy, if you try, to have a kind of overview. Biology and chemistry, it's tricky to do that. There's lots of facts that don't seem to, they seem to be arbitrary. But with physics, you can fit it all together. So what else? What else might the physics of guitar strings possibly have any relevance to? What about everything? Everything? All the particles in the universe are the same vibration, the different vibrations of the same tiny string. Strings so tiny that compared to the size of an atom, it's like comparing a guitar string to the entire universe. It could be that the universe is made of music. Hang on, we've got half hour left, yeah? Okay. Well, string theory could be a load of bombs, I don't know. Only a few thousand people in the world understand string theory properly. I'm not one of them, okay? And there's no evidence for or against it yet. There might never be. It might always be just maths. Bullshit. But it's such an interesting candidate for a theory of everything, a theory of your existence, that it's worth at least hearing what it's about. So here goes. Guys, you're going to have to, have to get you to stop talking again. Okay. So remember the harmonics of the string. Okay, there's different patterns of vibration of different frequencies. Now imagine that the string wasn't fixed at the end, like a guitar string, but the ends were like, guys, stop talking. But the ends were allowed to flap around, or you could join them in a loop. 
but they still have the same harmonics. Then we increase the tension in the string so that it shrinks. And we increase and increase the tension so that it shrinks and shrinks and shrinks until it's so small it looks like a point, a particle. String theory says that all the different particles in the universe, from the quarks that make the atoms that me and you are made of, to the electrons that form the electricity in my amps, to the photons of light coming off the lights, and even the graviton, the particle that carries the force of gravity. String theory says that all of these different particles are the different harmonics of the same tiny strings. Super strings. Mate, mate, you're not looking at me yet. You're not looking at me yet. You're not looking at me yet. You're not looking. Shut up. <laughs> are the different harmonics of the same tiny strings. Super strings, whose tension, 10 to the 39 tons of tension, that's one with 39 zeros after it, tons of tension, more stress than watching a soap opera, shrinks those strings so small we'd be forgiven for thinking they were just points. And it gets even weirder. What if these particles are the vibrations of tiny strings, but only the vibrations we can see in our three dimensions, while the strings existing and vibrating more than three? Remember the hologram. It took three dimensions worth of information and stored it on a two-dimensional surface. What if our universe stores within its three dimensions the information from more? Whoa, man. What am I talking about? More than three dimensions. We get that fine with just three, don't we? Our three dimensions are left, right, front, back, up and down. What are you going to call another one? <laughs> in fact, maybe it's because our brains are three-dimensional that we have such trouble imagining extra dimensions. We just have to do with metaphors and analogies. So, I'm going to tell you a story. Guys, I'm getting tired of telling you to shut up. Once upon a time, guys, just stop talking for a minute, will you? Once upon a time, there were a load of ants who lived on a piece of graph paper. In their perfectly flat world, they had no concept of up and down. They just couldn't think of it. It was like, <laughs> to us, was, we just couldn't think of it. One day, a sphere fell through their well. Mate, mate, I've told you once already, he's done it. Just stop talk. I think he's going to have to go out, is that alright? Yeah. Can we just send him out? He's been talking all the way through. Sorry mate, yeah, you, you are looking at me now, next to the one with the white hood, next to the one with the white hood, out mate, you've got to go. You've just got to go. I've told you about 50 times. Go on, next to the one with the white hood. That's it. Go on. No, next to the. Find a white hood. Find a white hood. 
That one, yeah, you're right. Go on, go mate. Give him a round of applause. Right, now guys, can we, can we just come to some kind of agreement? Can we just not talk? You can whisper. Right, everyone go like this. Ah. Uh, 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 that is the last time you can use your vocal cords, alright? Now everyone go like this. You can whisper, right? From now on, you can whisper, but you cannot use your vocal cords. Can we all agree on that? Is that okay? Is that all right? Yeah. Right. So, we've got our ants living on a flat world. One day, a sphere, a three-dimensional object, fell through their world, leaving a hole. Now, this upset the ants quite a lot, this hole from nowhere. Most of them were traditionally minded. Let's call them the militants. Okay. And they said, we'll never understand this. This must be magic, this hole from nowhere. It must be supernatural. We'll never explain it. It will be something of which we will forever be ignorant. But a small minority of the ants, who liked thinking in different ways, the deviants, they liked thinking outside the square, okay, uh, they said, maybe there is an explanation. So they looked at the footage of exactly what had happened, which was this. A point had appeared out of nowhere, grown into a small disc. That disc expanded to a maximum size, then shrank again to a point and disappeared. And the ant said, what if there's such a thing as a three-dimensional cell? Let's call it a sphere. See, if a sphere fell through our world, we'd only see its cross-section. So when it touched our plane at its south pole, we'd see a point, yeah? As the sphere continued down and through, that point would grow to a disc. That disc would grow to a maximum size at the equator of the sphere, yeah? Have we all got this? Yeah. Then it would shrink again to a point at the North Pole and disappear. And we'd say, clever at! Brilliant! What if we live, what if we live in three-dimensional graph paper? Can you do this with me now? Can you fill this room with imaginary 3D graph paper, lines going left, right, front, back, up, down? You kind of got that in your mind's eye, yeah? Uh, everyone got that in the, everyone imagining that? Loads of lines going left to right, even up the walls. Add to that loads of lines going front, back, even up the walls. You got those two together? Yeah. Now, loads of lines coming ceiling to floor throughout the room. You've got all of those three different kinds of lines in your head, yeah? That's 3D graph paper. What would you do if a point appeared in midair, grew into a small ball, that ball expanded to a maximum size, then shrank again to a point and disappeared. If we were as clever as those ants, 
we might guess that a four-dimensional sphere, a hypersphere, had just fallen through our three dimensions. Okay, I'll try again with the diagram. There's a point. Shh, guys. A point. Is that, does anyone else have to go in the next half hour? Anyone else have to go in the next 20 minutes, let's say? Anyone else need to go? Right. You're all staying here for 20 minutes, okay? There's a point. A zero dimensional object. I'm going to become a two dimensional being, a shadow. Imagine if I grab this and I pull it along one dimension. I get a line. Sorry, you, might, you guys might have to kind of lean over a bit to see. You can see it on there, actually. You guys just look at that. Um, a line is a one dimensional object. Imagine if again I grab that and I pull it up along a perpendicular dimension. I get a 2D object, a rectangle. Imagine if again I grab that and I pull it back along another perpendicular dimension. I get a 3D shape, a cuboid. You can imagine that rotating. Imagine if again I grab that and pulled it along another perpendicular dimension, I get a 4D cube, or hypercube. And one of those rotating looks like that. Now, I don't know about you, but that makes my eyes sick. Yeah. What the hell is going on there? <laughs> just, uh, have, a, have a chat to your friend. You can talk now, you can use your voice now, but just for one minute, okay? Have a chat. What do you think's going on there? How long have we got? 15 minutes or so? Right. Go now or stay for 15 minutes, alright? Go now or stay for 15 minutes. I did, guys, I did ask whether you'd have to go. Uh, everyone agrees to stay for 15 minutes and, and agrees not to leave, okay? Are we all agreed? Right. So that's an extra big dimension. String theory says the extra dimensions might be quite like that. They might be rolled up really tiny inside our big three. As though each of those lines of that graph paper you were imagining has its own hidden structure. String theory says we could roll up six or seven tiny dimensions inside our big three. If it, oh, guys, I just asked you. Right. I'm going to count to 10. If you need to leave in the next 15 minutes, go now. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Right. Okay. Everyone, just stay, okay? Don't walk out from now on. <laughs> okay. So. String theory says that each line might be a line. It might be kind of like a stack of really weird shapes called Calabi Yao manifolds. Don't ask me what that even represents. I think you have to have had acid on your cornflakes since childhood to understand maths like that. Um, but string theory says that if space was shaped like that, the vibrations of the tiny strings would look like our familiar particles. So I pulled a bit of a 
fast one on you. So kind of by magic, let's roll up six or seven tiny dimensions inside our big three to give a total of nine or ten. But this is called rock guitar in eleven dimensions. Anyone tell me a dimension I haven't mentioned yet? Right. Time. Right. What if time is like the extra big dimension I was talking about with the ants and that cube? So if we treated time kind of like another dimension of space, we might say things like next Tuesday or the year 1000 or the age of the dinosaurs. They're all different places in the universe. Can I get that? Yeah. In fact, treating time like another dimension of space isn't new at all. Einstein's relativity is all about space-time. All one word. As though it's all kind of the same stuff. So you might ask, what's the shape of space-time? What's the shape of everything? To understand that, let's go back to our ants. And let's really freak them out by putting them on our 3D world. Now one ant, one ant might set off to explore his new world. He might go off in one direction, keep going in that direction, Keep going all the way around the world. Magellan. Get back to his original position and go, that was weird. I kept going in one direction and I got back to my original place. That's bizarre. But these are clever ants. They work out the shape of their 3D world even though they're only 2D beings. They work out that they happen to live at a certain latitude, and if you go more north, the Earth is less expanded. The Earth starts as a point at the North Pole. It expands out to the equator. Then it shrinks again to a point at the South Pole, and that's the Earth. If the universe has four big dimensions and that fourth one is a bit like time, then just as the ants saw a less expanded Earth when they looked north, we'd see a less expanded universe when we looked back in time. I've dotted the galaxies of the universe on this balloon. If I pretend to look back in time by letting the air out of the balloon, the galaxies get closer and closer together. They're not moving, it's the space between them that's contracting until 13.7 billion Years ago, the universe was as small as it could possibly be. If you ask the ants, why does the Earth expand from the North Pole? They'll say, that's the shape of the world. If you ask the ants, what's north of the North Pole? They look really confused. What are you talking about? There's no such thing as north of the North Pole. Even if you fly above it in a helicopter, it's defined at sea level. North and North Pole, the words don't logically go together. You ask a physicist, what's before the universe? Get a similar answer. There's no such thing as before time. Because before is a time word. 
There's no such thing as next to space, because that would be space as well. There's no such thing as outside space-time. There's no such thing as nothing for something to come from or be created from. The universe has never not existed, okay? Now, I know that batters against your common sense. I'll do questions at the end, thanks. Common sense, that's okay. Einstein says common sense is just a collection of prejudices you get by the age of 18. So if you're not 18, there's hope, okay? Your teachers are screwed, but you might be okay. Um, the very latest measurements tell us more about the shape of everything. We no longer think the universe is like a 4D sphere which would expand smoothly from its North Pole, and then after the equator in future will contract again to a point, we don't think it's like that. We think that near the North Pole of the universe, there was an enormous expansion called inflation, then a smooth expansion, and then instead of there being an equator after which the universe will contract again in future, we think it's just going to continue to expand. So the universe is more like a 4D bell shape than a 4D sphere. So is there any evidence for this? Well, the evidence for treating time like another dimension of space, that's basically as well proven as anything in science ever is. The evidence for these tiny dimensions of string theory, not at all. There might never be definitive evidence one way or the other. But we live in an incredible time. Perhaps even the critical decade. Imagine that. Billions of years of evolution to produce a thinking ape Billions of these apes living and dying in history in complete bewilderment and ignorance about the nature of their universe and it finally becomes clear in your lifetime. What a time to live. Place to live, whatever. Kind of puts into perspective what those thinking apes usually think about, you know, <coughs> sport and fashion and money. It might even happen in the next couple of years. Just a few months ago, the biggest experiment in, in the world became operational again, after it broke. One of the things it's looking for is evidence of tiny dimensions, where it's looking for an awful lot more first. I'm talking about the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC. This is a huge particle accelerator built underground in Geneva. That tunnel is filled with 27 kilometers of superconducting magnets cooled by liquid helium. That really does make it sound funny. What those magnets do is they accelerate particles, protons, until they're a few miles an hour short of the speed of light before smashing them into each other at the sight of a vast detector. You can see the scale of this with this little fella. Well, he's not a little fella, he's a normal sized fella. He's just a big thing. The energy in each beam of protons is equivalent to a train at full speed, a goods train at full speed, but it's focused so tightly it could pass through the zero on a euro coin. The energy of the resulting collision is so unimaginably vast that it actually recreates the conditions right near the North Pole of the universe when the entire universe was squeezed into a volume about that big. The universe used to be that big and the energy it was at 
everywhere in the universe when it was that big, is recreated in Switzerland, only in the tiniest, tiniest bit of the universe now, but that energy is the same as the universe when it was that big. So what are we hoping to learn from this biggest experiment ever? We're hoping to learn more about this stuff called matter, this stuff we're made of. Now in school you get taught a bit about matter. I always thought what you get told in school raises more questions than it answers. In school you get shown something like this, and you're told it's an atom. So if that's an atom of sodium, that's the smallest bit of sodium you can have. And you're told that the word atom comes from the Greek for indivisible. You can't cut it any further. But then you're told that, actually, yes, you can subdivide it into electrons, which orbit a nucleus of protons and neutrons. You're even told that the neutrons themselves can further subdivide into a proton and an electron during radioactive decay. Incidentally, that's caused by something called the weak force. Uh, you've heard of the force of gravity. You might have heard of the electromagnetic force. Opposites attract like charges repel. This is a third one for you, the weak force. So atoms clearly aren't as indivisible as their name implies. Secondly, secondly, even the very idea of atoms seems kind of inconsistent. At school I put my hand up and said, Miss, if opposites attract, why don't the electrons just stick to the nucleus? And if like charges repel, why don't the protons just fly apart? And the answer I got was this. Shut up, they just don't. <laughs> so I basically had to do a physics degree to get the answer to a simple question. And the answer is this. Firstly, electrons are just weird. They only exist at certain energy levels, none of which are in the nucleus, and they don't move between energy levels, they kind of teleport instantly when you look at them. They're just bizarre, okay? Secondly, the reason the protons don't fly apart is because their repulsion is overcome by a very short range, very attractive force called the strong force. So that's a fourth one for you. You've got gravity, electromagnetic, weak, and now strong. And the particles that feel a strong force are called hadrons, hence the name Large Hadron Collider. Careful how you spell hadron, by the way. Now, we think we understand how three of these forces fit together. The electromagnetic, the weak, and the strong. But the only way we can prove that theory is by experimentally observing what the theory predicts. One well, of the most important predictions of the theory is something called a Higgs field. And to understand, understand what that is, I'm going to need two volunteers. Two volunteers. There's one. One more volunteer. Someone over here. One volunteer. Yeah, that would be great. If you would both come down here, thanks. Right, I'm hoping you're all going to be able to see this. So, uh, if you can stand there, that's great. And you can stand by the plant facing him. What are your names, by the way? Alice. Miracle. Okay, so you're each going to have a brick on a rope, okay? When I say one, two, three, go, you're going to grab the brick with one hand, don't touch the rope, okay, just one hand, and you're going to shake it from side to side, like this, as fast as you can, okay? You don't understand, need to understand why you're doing that. Uh, right, now two rules, first, you're not allowed to say anything from now on, even though you might be tempted to. Second, you must not let go of the brick until it's stopped, okay? Because that's kind of dangerous. So let's uh, let's make sure let's make sure these are the same length. Yeah, that's about right. So grab the brick with one hand, 
and shake it from side to side, side to side, side to side, much further, 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 faster, 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 stop the brick, and relax, let go. Thanks very much, round of applause for our brick shake. So what did we learn now? We learned it's kind of difficult to move a brick from side to side. And it's definitely difficult to move bricks upwards. Look out! <laughs> Best 10 euros I ever spent. <laughs> Hurry up, Rick! Uh, yeah, don't worry, I know on the way up. Uh, real brick bought in a hardware shop. Yeah, I bought a single brick in a hardware store. So, uh, yeah, I'm building a very small wall. Question! Why was it more difficult to move the real brick? Because it was Heavier, more massive. Slightly more difficult question. What kind of force or field makes it difficult to move heavy things? Gravity. Gravity? Good guess, but wrong. You see, I was holding up both bricks against gravity. No one was doing any up and down work against gravity at all. They were just going side to side. In fact, even if we got into spacesuits and we went to the deepest, darkest space between galaxies where there is no gravity Maybe. it would still be difficult to move the real brick I, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you the English name okay? modern physics shh guys shh, shh, shh. oh come on girls I did ask Okay. Go on, Ed. Right. Modern physics proposes a field like a gravitational field, but which permeates the entire universe, called a Higgs field, that gives things their mass and makes them difficult to move. And that's called inertia. Does that sound uh, familiar? The English word inertia? Is that, what, is that about the same as the Greek word you just said? Yeah. Inertia. Inertia. Yeah. Okay? So if the LHC could detect that Higgs field, we could explain why life is so much effort. And you know what? They've just found it. Who watched the news on, thir on Tuesday? Anyone watch the news on Tuesday? Yes. Remember what was on the news at all? Yes. Nothing about some big experiment? Yes. Maybe finding the God particle? Yes, yes kind of a... Uh, kind of... What, oh, the teacher's never heard of it either, Jesus! Okay. Right, all right, I'll tell you, okay, I'll tell you about it. You guys are so lucky, this lecture is timed precisely right, and you just, whoa, what would you uh, Right. So how do we find this field? In physics, if you look for a field, you look for the particles associated with it, like the excitations of the field. In this case, it's called a Higgs boson, and if it exists, and it, we're looking in the right energy range, it should produce a path of collisions that looks something like that. Um, but that's going to be hidden within literally billions of other paths, so it's going to be really difficult to find. Uh, the Higgs boson is named after a guy called Peter Higgs, who was actually one of my lecturers at Edinburgh University. 
That's kind of weird that your teacher gets the universe named after him. Uh, and it's also been called the God Particle, maybe because it provide, creates matter, make, gives things substance. I don't think that's a very good name for it, and anyway, Peter looks nothing like God, really, does he? <laughs> but they might have just found it on Tuesday. This week is a monumental week in human history, right? Watch the friggin' news. As well as matter, we're having to learn more about something called antimatter. Now, do you remember me saying that one of the harmonics of the string was the electron, and that they're weird? <coughs> Turns out that another of the harmonics is the anti-electron, or positron. And they're even weirder. You see, when a positron meets an electron, the two annihilate in a process we don't really understand to give nothing but energy. Yeah, I realise it wasn't a very impressive trick. This one's better, alright? Oh! Well, no it isn't. <laughs> so, um, yeah, in 1908, this guy, oh actually, I don't, I don't Weirder still, sometimes you start with nothing but energy and suddenly a pair of particles pops into existence from nowhere. Oh. So this guy... <laughs> so just two more minutes, right, two more minutes guys, and just listen for two more minutes. In 1908, this guy, Robert Peary, set off on his voyage to become the first... Guys, shh, 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 just two more minutes, all right? To become the first person to explore the North Pole. And he didn't really know what he'd find. Hundred years later, we're about to explore the North Pole of the universe. And we don't know what we'll find either. And it's some of you guys who could be the explorers who make those revolutionary discoveries. See, the experiment only started this year. The real task of interpreting and refining the results will peak in a few years' time when you guys are at university or maybe doing a postgraduate degree. And I can tell you that maths, physics, engineering, computer science, anything where you use maths to analyse things you're going to get a much better job with that than pretty much anything else. So finally, the aspect of this experiment I find most interesting is the search for these hidden dimensions. Now it's really unlikely to find any such evidence, but it might just be true that we, these incredible biological computers, made of stardust are actually holograms of a piece of music being played in 11 dimensions. If I didn't know any better, I'd say that sounded like a kind of magic. <laughs>